A message today comes from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. The title of the message, He Called His Name Jesus. He Called His Name Jesus. Let's read what Matthew wrote here. He said, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Christmas Day is only a few days from today. Radio stations have been telling us about Santa Claus coming to town, and Frosty the Snowman is having a great time, isn't he, here? The Hallmark channels have inundated us with Christmas trees and decorations and beautiful couples finding true love. Neighbors have decorated their houses with lights, and it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Not too long ago, liberal progressives were trying to abolish public nativity scenes and other public expressions of the Christmas season. But it seems as if that has dropped as a futile attempt on their part, at least for the moment, but it's still lurking in the shadows. Nevertheless, our culture has succeeded in secularizing Christmas and losing consciousness of its significance. Our lesson for today recalls the significance of that original nativity scene in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. Our scripture for today tells the Christmas story from Joseph's perspective. Joseph was a young professional carpenter somewhere around 30 years of age. He was engaged to a young woman perhaps 15 or 16 years old. Now we really do not know much about the parents of Joseph and Mary, but they had agreed together in the forthcoming marriage between Joseph and Mary. Now the Jewish religious laws of the time with respect to marriage were a little different compared to our modern ideas. Engagement at the time was sort of like a pre-marriage marriage. There was a legal bond between the bride and the bridegroom. While the bride and groom were bound to each other, they did not yet live together as man and wife. Both were to remain sexually pure until the marriage vows had been exchanged. Any sexual contact, especially with another person, was the legal equivalent to adultery and was punishable by death under the law of Moses. So engagement was a serious thing at this time. Today, engagement appears to be taken less seriously. It seems that the term engagement simply means that a couple is living together. In fact, it's not uncommon nowadays for engaged couples to even have children. Well, this is totally unacceptable in the time of Joseph and Mary when they were engaged. Now, verse 18 of our lesson tells us that before they came together, she, Mary, was found with child. 
In other words, Mary was expecting a baby. And it was for certain that Joseph was not the father. So what was Joseph to do? This is a very conscientious man, a very religious man. Okay, what was he to do? He could have had her stoned to death as an adulteress. That was a very real possibility. But Joseph was a compassionate man, and he did not want to subject Mary and her family to that kind of disgrace. So what was he supposed to do? Can you even put yourself in his place and just imagine the stress that he was having? Well, verse 20 says that while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. God had to send an angel to relieve him of that stress and give him the instructions of what he needed to do. Now, if you've read your Bible, you know that Joseph was not the only man in the Bible to be visited by an angel with news about a baby. But he is the only man ever in history to be told that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. All other births were natural births. But this was divine. This was miraculous. This was initiated by the Holy Spirit of God. The angel prefaced his news, telling Joseph, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. This had been a lot for Joseph to process. Undoubtedly, he was dumbfounded. There were things happening he could not understand, and they were happening quite rapidly. Well, the Gospel of Luke records the Annunciation to Mary. The Annunciation, it's a fancy term of how Mary was informed that she was going to have this baby, okay? Luke chapter 1, verse 26, 27 tells us that Mary was betrothed to Joseph. The story is the same in Matthew and in Luke. Unknown to Mary at first, her elderly cousin Elizabeth had conceived a baby six months earlier. The angel Gabriel appears to Mary, informing her she had been chosen by God to conceive and give birth to a child she was to call Jesus, who was to be the very Son of God. And then he instructed her to go to Hebron to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Now Hebron was a city south of Jerusalem several days, traveling from Nazareth where she was actually living at the time. And it's probable that Joseph and Mary's betrothal had just taken place. God now instructs her to leave Nazareth, providing proof that Joseph could not possibly be the father of her child. God does everything right. He's going to prove that this baby was a miraculous baby, not just the son of Joseph. The conception of Jesus took place the moment Mary arrived at Elizabeth's house, as recorded in Luke chapter 1, verse 48 to 48. Okay? You'll read that. It's fascinating. Uh, Elizabeth welcomes her, and her baby leaps inside of her. And uh, she says, Mary, what God's promised you is going to happen. And then right then, immediately, Mary says, what the Lord has said has happened. That was the moment of conception, right there at the front door of Elizabeth's house. Okay? In verse 56 of that same chapter, it tells us that Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months, and then she returned to Nazareth. When she returned home, she had just completed her first trimester of her pregnancy. The fact that she was expecting a child just could not be hidden. 
Possibly and logically, her mother may have been the very first one to notice. Joseph had to be told. Which brings us to our lesson today. It was necessary for the angel Gabriel to tell Mary of the forthcoming child. And now it is necessary for him to tell Joseph. And we notice from what the angel says to him, it is the very same message that he gave to Mary earlier. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Friends, this is the first mystery of Christmas. God somehow bypasses the normal reproductive process to bring this child into the world. Now, it's easy for non-believers to disbelieve in the virgin conception of Jesus. But to those who know God is the creator of life, it's easy for us to believe that the creator God can use physical nature to his own advantage. He created it, and he can manipulate it any way he needs to accomplish the purpose he gets to accomplish. And in this particular case, the Holy Spirit that blew breath into Adam's lung at creation now interacted with that cell in Mary's womb, bringing it into life. That's a mystery. But as believers in creation, we can accept that. That's a fact. The second mystery of Christmas is the Incarnation. We might be able to grasp the concept of the virgin birth, but understanding the Incarnation is beyond human capacity. It is something we must accept by faith. As the Holy Spirit moved on that one microscopic cell in Mary's body, the second person of the Godhead entered that cell and united himself with human life. At no time did he cease to be God, but he personally limited himself to natural human development through the nine-month gestation period. At the proper time of development, that baby came into the world by means of a natural human birth. Mary didn't go to an emergency room in a hospital to have the baby. She was in a stable, and there he was laid in a manger. And in all things natural, Jesus was indeed a human baby. He could not walk or speak. He nursed from his mother's breasts. He needed to have his diapers changed regularly. <laughs> You don't normally think about that when you think of Jesus, do you? <laughs> yeah. How many here have been, or our parents, I should say? You know about that diaper changing stuff. Yeah, you know, I was my daddy, but even I had to change diapers. <laughs> you know, it's supposed to be mama's job, but somehow dad gets to, you, did you get, have to change diapers? You did, okay, good, yeah. So, with all those things showing he was indeed human, but yet he was Emmanuel, God with us. The Incarnation is the greatest miracle ever to happen in history, and it is the most important event in human existence. On that night, when the baby was born, Joseph called his name Jesus, as he and Mary had been told by the angel. Now Isaiah prof prophesied of this night in Isaiah 7, 14, indicating that God was coming into human existence. He wrote, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The literal meaning of the name Emmanuel is the strong God with us. 
you know, the Bible there says the translated God with us, but the real meaning of that Hebrew name is the strong God with us and reflects the truth of what John wrote in John chapter 1 and verse uh, 1 and 14 where he wrote, the Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now the name Jesus is a Hebrew name, uh, Yahashua, which comes from the verb to save, deliver, or put in safety, or a place of safety. It was a, actually a common name among the Jews. The Amplified Bible enlarges on what the angel told Joseph here in verse 21. It translates this way. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, in Hebrew means Savior, for he will save his people from their sins, that is, prevent their falling and missing the true end and scope of life, which is in God. I think that's an insightful commentary on that verse. Adam Clark also helps us to understand the meaning of the name Jesus. He wrote, He shall save his people from their sins. This shall be his great business in the world, the great errand on which he has come vis-a-vis -vis, to make atonement for and to destroy sin, deliverance from all the power, guilt, and pollution of sin it is the privilege of of every believer in Christ Jesus. Less than this is not spoken of in the gospel, and less than this would be unbecoming the gospel. The perfection of the gospel system is not that it makes allowances for sin, but that it makes an atonement for it. Not that it tolerates sin, but that it destroys it. Thank you, Dr. Clark, for your words. Albert Barnes, another commentary, says the same things in a different words. He wrote, He shall save. This expresses the same as the name, and on this account the name was given to him. He saves men by having died to redeem them, by giving the Spirit to renew them by his power in enabling them to overcome their spiritual enemies, in defending them from danger, in guiding them in the path of duty, in sustaining them in trials and in death. And he will raise them up at the last day and exalt them to a world of purity and love. That baby born in Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago, was God's greatest gift to human race. He was not given to us just to be a risen for us to give gifts to each other. <laughs> That's a common explanation about Jesus. Oh, God gave Jesus so we give presents to each other. Jesus has been lost to the modern Christmas celebration. He has been pushed aside for decorations, family get-togethers, presents, and traditions. Now, there's nothing wrong with those things by themselves. But when they displace Jesus, they become idols that obliterate the very love of God expressed in Christ's coming. You know, there was a time, as described in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, when people would go to church on Christmas Day to worship God and give thanks for the coming of Christ into the world. Nowadays, more churches than not have to close on Christmas Day because no one will come. Presents, meals, football games, and such have become far more important than the incarnation and the atonement for sin made possible through the Incarnation. Friends, Jesus came to save 
sinners. That's what Christmas is all about. As a rule, most people just don't see themselves as sinners. Now, people acknowledge they are not perfect. They acknowledge they do bad things or, and they could be better, but they give no thought that they are actually accountable to the Creator God. The very word sinner has lost its real meaning. To some, it's an insult. You know, if you say, well, you're a sinner, they say, well, don't call me a sinner. You're just saying you think you're better than me. Have you ever run into that? Yes. To others, the word is simply meaningless. They say all people are sinners, but saying such does not express any kind of moral accountability for being a sinner, whatever that is in their minds. People are born into the world with a native depravity inherited through the fall of Adam and Eve. This depravity perverts the perception of morality into selfishness that defines a person's life and places it in opposition to the will of God. This is sin. And this is what Jesus came into the world to save us from. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Peter wrote, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Since Jesus is our Savior, and he died to save us from our sins, it is our place to accept what he's done for us and to die to sin ourselves. But why are people so reluctant to accept what Jesus has done for them? One reason is that most people do not see themselves as sinners and needing salvation. Some people rely on the fact that they see themselves as good people, and they do not do many things that are really wrong, at least in their estimation. Some feel that any religion is good enough, and they feel no need to accept the facts of the gospel. Still, others are afraid of what they will have to give up if they accept Jesus Christ. Now, some of that is due to their misunderstanding of the gospel, and some of it is due to misrepresentation of the gospel in some churches. And some of it is due to the overzealousness of some Christians. And some of it is due to their own love or attachment to a particular sin they enjoy all too much. And then others just think that living a righteous life would be dull and boring. How can anyone have fun being a prude and going to church all the time? Well, the answer to that question is, no one can have fun that way. But living for God is a far more enjoyable lifestyle than a sinner can comprehend. And friend, you have to be here to understand that. So, his name is called Jesus because he alone saves us from the sin that separates us from God. Jesus came as a little baby in the Bethlehem manger so long ago. He came to be much more than a cute and adorable baby as many Christmas hymns portray him to be. He came for one purpose, to save us from sin. So have you been saved from sin? Have you received God's Christmas present for you? Amen.